Okay, so before lunch, we were remarking that some of the truth tables that we had seen for some relatively simple circuits were equivalent. And I was showing you one in particular. Let's go over here now to our whiteboard. And I was showing you one in particular that suggested that this one is also the same as this one, like that. And then we also went over another one that suggested that this one is the same as this one, like that. And it turns out that these two are famous examples of de Morgan's law. And Augustus de Morgan uh, discovered these laws during the 1800s, so it's a relatively recent phenomenon that we came across this knowledge. And in order to understand where these laws come from, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a very short video for you that explains the derivation of these laws using something that you're probably already familiar with called a Venn diagram. So let's have a look at that for a second. OK, so uh, he just mentioned something I forgot to mention. This De Morgan's Law and this Boolean logic in general Strangely, it has applications not only in computer science, but also in electrical engineering, also if you're taking like formal logic courses in philosophy in college, it comes up a lot. Uh, you can see it's in parts of mathematics like set theory and in probability. So what happens is that this type of logic and the De Morgan's Law simplifications in particular even if you decide you're not going to pursue a career in computer science, it's just really useful information to have in all these diverse fields. And the fact that the logic is exactly the same across these diverse fields is really kind of amazing, I think. OK, so <clears throat> that is a, a little bit of a visual, that is a visual demonstration of why these De Morgan's laws work. If you were having trouble following along with uh, the Venn diagrams. I'm going to give you a simpler example of how to do this. And simply, we can state the De Morgan's Law as the following. We can say that we can change an AND expression. We can change it to an OR expression. We can change an AND to an OR if we do two things. We have to invert the inputs. And we have to invert the output. And likewise, we can also change an OR into an AND expression using exactly the same set of rules. What we have to do is invert the inputs and invert the output. So I'm going to give you some examples of this. And we'll see why these laws are so useful. Because a lot of times, they let us take a complicated expression and simplify it significantly. OK, so let's look over here. We already showed you the two basic ones. Now let's look at a more complicated example. Let's say it looks like this. Let's say it's not A and B not like that. And we're trying to figure out what would be an equivalent using an OR expression, an OR expression. Just so you know, this is the way we write it in Java. A lot of times you'll see it written other ways, depending on what profession is using the logic. One way that you'll see it, it would be like this, like that. But these basically mean the same thing. <clears throat> the other thing I wanted to show you is that expressions like this are also used by electrical engineers to design circuits. If you took AP computer science principles, we did a tiny bit of that. We're not going to do that in this course because it's not part of our curriculum. But I just want to give you one example of this. So this expression right here, in terms of electrical engineering, could be written like this, like that, where I'm taking the inverse of A, I'm ending it <coughs> with B, and I'm taking the output, and I'm taking the inverse of it, like that. These things are called inverter gates. This is an AND gate. And if you ever needed one, this would be what an OR gate looks like. This is what an AND gate looks like. And these circuits, the AND, the OR, and the NOT, 
you can build any piece of electronics you want, including that computer, just with these three gates. You'd need millions of them, but try to understand that these are the basic building blocks for all digital electronics that exist today. So you can see that understanding this is important, not only for computer science, but also for hardware design. Using these things to design gates and build electronics is a profession. That's a profession. Sometimes students are not sure whether they want to major in computer science or major in something that's half hardware design and half software like computer science. And those people sometimes take a major in, in college. Does anybody know what that major is called? Yes. Is it computer engineering? It's computer engineering. And basically, this lets you straddle both realms. You learn some computer science, which is the software part you're learning in my class. But then it also teaches you stuff like this, which has to do with hardware design. The, one of the nice things about computer si engineering versus computer science is that you actually get to build physical things if you enjoy that. I think I mentioned to you that probably 10 years ago when I started teaching CSA, the world was probably 75% men and 25% women in the field of computer science. I believe that's been somewhat reduced now. It's probably 60, 65 percent and coming down. But this part, there has not been much progress made here from a gender sp a specific standpoint. This is still a, a heavily male-dominated profession. I mentioned this especially to the ladies here who might want to think about something a little bit out of the box that might be worth considering if this is of interest to you. Okay, that was a little tangent on my part. Let's go back to where we were. And I mentioned to you that we can turn this into an OR statement, an OR statement by inverting the inputs and inverting the outputs. So let's look at how we would do that. So I'm going to convert this. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to convert from an AND gate to an OR gate, like that. And I'm going to take the inputs and I'm going to invert them. Now this is the existing input, right, not A and I'm going to invert it. How do I invert it? Well, I just put an inverter in front of it like that. And then the other input I have is a B, and I'm going to invert that. And finally, I'm going to invert the output. The output was originally like this, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to invert it like that. And so now what I can do is I can start to simplify. Can anyone guess what happens when I have two inverters next to each other? Mr. Borden, what do you think, sir, when I have they two? Cancel. They cancel each other. So now I can cancel these two and these two. And so now I can come back down to this simple expression. And you can see that this is a much easier expression to understand than this one. Yes, sir? That's right. You have to invert the output. That's part of De Morgan's law. So what I'd like you to do now is, just as an exercise, draw the truth table for the red expression and then draw the truth table for the black expression. Please do that now. Yes, sir? <clears throat> no, it is possible. We'll get to that in a few minutes. Okay, let's work through the exercise. Let's look at the first one. And you can see here that I've got all my various uh, things here. Now, one of the reasons that CSA students don't like truth tables is that they're extremely time consuming. So on the multiple choice portion of the exam, students usually only use a truth table as a method of last resort. In other words, they try to think out the problem because they're going to be under time pressure. Now, you haven't been under time pressure yet, but as the units start to grow, you'll see that I'm going to squeeze you on the amount of time you have on your quizzes. And eventually, by the time May comes around, you'll have pretty much exactly the same amount of time on your quizzes and tests as you get on your actual AP exam. And uh, so what's going to happen here is that you, you get, you'll get to some uh, multiple choice questions on your test and you'll be like, yeah, I really don't want to use the truth table because it just takes too darn long to fill it out. But it, if, you don't, if you can't solve it any other way and you're done with the rest of the test, a truth table even though it takes a long time, is pretty much guaranteed to work if you put in the time. You can see that it's fairly straightforward. Okay, so uh, let's look at this expression right here. 
And I'm going to put in a 0, 0. And I'll notice also, by the way, that when the b variable, whenever it's a 0, this portion of the, ex uh, of the expression that's inside the parentheses is going to be of what value? When b it's already false. And then this part here is going to invert it to be true. So therefore, I already know that whenever b is 0, the output's going to be true. So that's going to help me reduce the amount of time I spend on my truth table. And likewise here, I can see that if A is 0 and B is 1, this, this entire part is going to be a 1. And then the inverter is going to turn it into a false here like that. And this part here, if A is 1, this is going to be a 0. And then this is going to be a 1. So I think that's right. Is that what everybody else got? Yeah. OK. Now let's look at this one and see if it comes up with the same thing. We can see that whenever A is 1, it's automatically the whole expression is going to be a 1. So we know that we're going to get 1's here. And then we can see whenever B is 0, it's also going to be a 1. And so this is going to be the only time that's not the case. And we can see that the two expressions are the same. I think Mr. Degouge had mentioned that we can also think about distributing this not sign inside here. And we can do that. And you can see that it's going to take, here, take place in front of the A and the B. And then we're going to allow, that's going to allow us to convert the AND into an OR. So if you want to think of it as distributive property, you can think of it like that also. So um, I don't know, uh, I don't believe that De Morgan's Law applies to exclusive OR. And I've never seen any simplifications for exclusive OR. OK. Now, I want to be clear about De Morgan's Law. De Morgan's Law doesn't just have to be applied to an entire expression. It can also be applied to a part of an expression. So let me show you that now. If I have something like this, if you wanted to, you could just apply De Morgan's Law just to this part of the expression, let's say right here. Okay, So you can just replace just the part in the black parentheses with the De Morgan equivalent and then keep the rest of it here. Let's try that now. Miss Caitlin, are you finished? OK, what did you get for the part in the parentheses, miss? Not B and not B. OK. And then we keep the other part the same. And I think you will agree with me that this particular expression is a lot easier to understand than the other one. Yes? So you can see that De Morgan's Law can be useful to simplify parts of expressions that can then give you clarity on the entire expression. Now, before we finish up De Morgan's Law, I'm going to look up an example from the College Board site of a typical multiple choice question that involves De Morgan's Law. And I'm going to ask you to work on this either by yourself or with a partner. And then we will declare victory on De Morgan's Law. OK. Let's look at this particular question. And it's asking, which of the following Boolean expressions is equivalent to this expression? And they want to know which one is the same. I like the E choice, yeah. Now, if you weren't sure how to use De Morgan's Law, you could also build truth tables for this entire thing. And each of these things, you could see how that could take some time, right? Especially with E being the right answer, you won't get, that, get to that until like three, four minutes later. And you'll be like, oh my god, I wasted four minutes on this one problem. But you can see that if you use the De Morgan's, you can get the answer much more quickly. So De Morgan's fast, truth table slow. OK, but truth table, it, truth table is a hammer. That's basically a hammer. OK, so if, you, if it doesn't work, you can hit it with a bigger hammer. The truth table is a bigger hammer. The De Morgan's involves thinking, so that's why it, it reduces the amount of time you need to find the answer. So that's the typical kind of De Morgan's Law question. Uh, I'll, I'll share a personal anecdote with you. Um, I took a circuit design course in college called COLD, Computer Organization Logic Design. COLD was the acronym. And they give you, like, you see this expression? They, they give you expressions like this like with seven or eight variables. And you have to use De Morgan's like four or five times to simplify and see which one equals on the multiple choice. So this can get really, really hairy. But you're just learning the basics of it now for high school.